Our history shapes us into who we are. It teaches us to fight, to love, and to never give up on our dream. My history is one of resilience and able to succeed even in the darkest of times. My history is one that should have never been written, but somehow against all circumstances, I was granted this opportunity, which I'm very grateful for. Tel Aviv is one of the three big cities in Israel. Uh, I would say the more urban. Tel Aviv is a beach a city. You can go eat a lot of boulevards. When you grow up more, there's a lot of bars, a lot of clubs. Growing up, I didn't really play too much sport, but I played a little bit of soccer. I always loved football, like American football, from my dad. For his bar mitzvah, what he all asked for was to go to New York and go to a, to a Giants game. That was his wish. I remember the first game I watched was like the Steelers against someone and Troy Polamalu gave a concussion to someone and I was like, this is so cool. So I always wanted to be an NFL player until I started playing volleyball. In middle school, we had like two hours a week where we can choose like a different class. And uh, I heard that in the warm up for a volleyball class, you play soccer and it was really fun. So I went for that. I actually started in uh, beach volleyball. My friend from school brought me there. And then the same friend actually brought me to indoor volleyball. In 10th grade, I went to Wingate Institute Academy it's basically a boarding school. We call it an academy for sports. So when we got there, there was an Israeli player playing in UC Irvine. And you were like, wow, this is so cool. This is basically the American dream. So since then, we just thought about that almost every day. Like, hey, I want to get there. I want to get a degree, play volleyball in the US. Military service is mandatory in Israel for everyone, unless you get like medical exemption or religious exemption. I didn't. But they do recognize the fact that you're an athlete and you play sports, whatever sport it might be. So like you have student athlete, you have soldier athlete, which means you go through basic training. It's about a month and a half. And then I served for two years, eight months as a teacher at a, at a school. It was kind of like last chance school. So all the kids in the city, they got thrown out of their school. They have learning disabilities. So we just helped them get through high school with really individual care and get their diploma and get them off the streets. That was just making the most out of my service because obviously I couldn't go to combat because I was still a volleyball player. I always loved giving back. In hindsight, giving back to, to all these kids was really fulfilling. It was just like a really, really good position in the army for me to be both an athlete and a soldier. It was like the best of both worlds. I started in the national team around the age of 16 or 17. And then I was also really happy to be called up to the senior national team. Right out of high school, I graduated June 19, and then I got drafted July 19, so about three weeks after school. There's a guy called Mark, he's a uh, Brazilian. He played in my club for the senior team when I was around 15, 16 years old. Then I watched him play, so I kind of knew his level, his potential, and then we build up, you know, a very one-to-one -one individualized 360 degree profile for, you know, the U.S. and mapping the market according to his characteristics. I started getting offers around July of 2021. And then I had a few offers, but none of them just compared to Ball State. From the first Zoom call, I love Coach. His leadership and his work ethic is unbelievable. And a lot of it is because of that military training prior to arriving, the mentorship opportunities he had. When I committed, it was obviously, I was really happy. I felt really lucky. 
but I would say a lot of things had to go in a certain way and direction for me to be sitting here having this interview, you know? Like all the small little things had to happen. My mom's side has suffered some horrific things. My father was in the lodge ghetto in Poland. So the the Lodz ghetto was a it was a it was a sort of a special ghetto in the uh, in the Nazi occupation of Poland in a couple of ways. The ghetto was designed for you to die in the ghetto. Nobody was expected to live the ghetto. There were lots of little possible ways to get out, but what's important to stress is that it, it is, it's all by chance. He was put through the death blocks, so towards the end of the war, the Nazis just decided to let the Jews walk bare naked you know, in the snow until they died. When you think about what it's like to be on the death march, you've got to realize that if you're on the death march, you've already survived everything up to that point. The Russians were approaching from the east, we were approaching from the west, they knew things were over. So their last ditch effort was to clean out all of the, the death centers and all the concentration camps and try to march all of the prisoners who were still there back into Germany itself. My father survived it. He was one of the few who did. My mother was very, very lucky. She was in the ghetto, but as a young lady, she was a very beautiful woman. She was blonde with green eyes, and Mengele was uh, very interested in extraordinary uh, appearances. Dr. Mengele, the Nazi doctor, he was known for doing experiments on Jews. Dr. Mengele, uh, his experiments, his infamous experiments, were in Auschwitz. And to call him a scientist is to demean scientists. He was, he was not a real scientist. And so he devised a series of experiments under the, the guise of doing quote-unquote medical experiments because we have so many patients, we have so many Jews in one place. Let's see if we can figure out how some of this science works. He actually thought that my grandmother was too beautiful to experiment on. It's kind of flattery, I guess, in kind of a weird way. That would be the only way she really could survive the Mengele experiments because most of the, most of the experiments, you know, the survival rate is, is nearly zero. On the other side of the family, my dad's dad, he served in the U.S. military in Japan, World War II. My grandparents from both sides were smart enough to see what was going to happen in, in Europe at the time and to escape in the last moment. My father's parents, they were living in uh, Slovakia at the time. And at the time, the Germans allowed Jews to leave because they didn't want them around. And uh, they had travel papers with a big J stamped on it. J for Jew, and they traveled by train through Nazi Germany to Holland, to by ferry to the UK, and their plan was actually to take a ship to Australia, but then the war broke out and the shipping lines were, were cut and they got on the ship and they also made it to the east coast of the United States. It was either they were going to get out then or they would have had to have survived that entire process to the very end to have another chance to try and get out. My grandma, his mom, she was born in Warsaw, Poland. And when they saw the uprising of the Nazis and Hitler and everything, they wanted to escape. My mother's family, her father was a journalist in Warsaw, Poland. And in August of 1939, he was in a conference in Geneva. He realized that there's going to be a war and that it's going to be catastrophic for the Jews. 
So on September 1st, 1939, my grandfather came home and he said, okay, everybody pack a small suitcase and we're leaving in half an hour. We're going to the train station and escaping to the east. That's one of those windows that's about this big. Yeah, September 1st, 1939 is when uh, the German Blitzkrieg started into Poland. And within a matter of hours, um, the Blitzkrieg tactic was to get in fast moving tanks and to just drive to Warsaw. They didn't stop, they didn't pause. And before the Poles knew what happened, like I say, within eight to 12 hours, the, the capital Warsaw is surrounded by German tanks. In a series of, of what can be called miracles, there were a few trains that left Warsaw on that very day, and most of them were bombed, and theirs wasn't. And they, they traveled south to the, to the Romanian border, and at night, half of the refugees were killed by the peasants or the, the villagers in that area. And when they managed, they, they turned around and they went back north. And there was a Japanese chancellor in Poland. His name was Sugihara. Shugihara is a, is, a, is a major figure in the rescue of Europe's Jews. There was no place that the Jews could run in Europe to get away from the Nazis' reach. And so he realized that you know, his, his country has thousands and thousands of open visas that they can use. And so he just willy-nilly just started giving them to every Jew that, that, you know, that, that came across his radar. My grandma's dad accidentally bumped into him in the street after hours after he finished work and begged him to give his family visa to, to save their, uh, their lives. He did, and they fled to Japan. From Japan, they came to the U.S. In terms of the odds of them surviving in this story, for anyone to do it is remarkable, but for all four of the grandparents to do it in multiple different ways, and they eventually, you know, all get back together like that, it's just, it's remarkable. Just to have him here, you see him in the gym. He's a warrior when he works, and guys see that, and I think it's raised the level, but he's a tremendous leader. Nobody cares, nobody cares. Keep your excuses, only two types of people in life. Coach asked us which two words do we feel represent us in Ball State. The two words I chose were privilege and family. I would say the word privilege kind of goes hand in hand in this situation with uh, Lucky. Not everyone have their hard work pay off, but I don't like to think of myself as a hard worker too much. I try to act like it, but I feel like if you think that you work hard, you kind of like lay off a little bit. In hindsight, it definitely, it definitely is the reason I'm here. It's just the hard work and the, the will to be here. The importance of family to me is everything. In my life, it's pretty much the most stable thing I have. So it means the world to me. My family is, is everything. I have a tattoo for them. My tattoo of five stars, it is simply there to remind me of my four other family members, my core family members. We all live in different places in the world. So it's my reminder to me that I'll always have my family and I love them very much and they're always with me. The tattoo that is on my forearm is uh, dedicated to my late grandmother, which was the only one that uh, I ever got to meet. And uh, where it comes to represent is my connection to her and my, my history of my family. My name in Hebrew means deer, the animal, therefore the deer antlers. And then her favorite flower was a bird of paradise, which is basically this. That's just my way to commemorate her. So for me to come here after my grandmother came here after, the, uh, after being in Poland is just kind of closing a circle, you know? It teaches me that like 
as low as the odds of being born are. Like, the odds of you being as how you are. I'm so much more lucky than that. For all my generations to survive all that they have, I'm so fortunate and so lucky to be here. Me and my brothers and sisters, my mom and dad, just extremely lucky.